My next guest has been described as a genius and one of the most influential intellectuals in the world. But leftist publications like The Guardian and Crikey have labelled him a dangerous culture warrior and a frightening thug. Jordan Peterson is a best-selling author, leading commentator and a professor of psychology. And he's coming back to Australia in late November with his tour Beyond Order, 12 More Rules for Life. It's an absolute pleasure to speak with the man who has changed so many lives with his incredible body of work. Jordan Peterson, welcome to the Rita Panahi Show. There's so much we can discuss, but let's start with men. You argue that the masculine spirit is under assault. Uh, explain what you mean by that and what it all means for young men in the Western world. Well, young men, boys are generally pilloried, let's say harassed for their toy preferences. Boys have a proclivity to enjoy playing with gadgets and guns and weapons, toy weapons. And uh, I read a funny article the other day, a woman who had a young boy, uh, she had banned anything that looked even vaguely like a weapon from the house, of course. and he would run around the house trying to shoot the cat with the toothbrush. And uh, she was appalled by that. And then when boys, yeah, and she said she threw her hands up in despair because, you know, her boy would just stop being a boy, which is, of course, extraordinarily annoying. And then when boys go to school, they're told that human beings are cancer on the planet and that we're destroying everything and that masculine ambition and ability is the main main contributor to that and then if that doesn't work then they're informed through junior high and high school and university that they're all part of the oppressive male patriarchy and that it would be better if they just stayed home in their basement and stayed away from women and the world and so that's uh let's call that a demoralizing message shall we and leave it at that but then men still dominate the, the corporate world. They hold most of the wealth and power. Isn't that in itself proof of male privilege? Well, first of all, male, men don't. A very small minority of men do. And that's actually a very different idea because men are overrepresented at the bottom end of the distribution as well. And But no one cares about men who are represented at the bottom end of the distribution, so we don't talk about that. And the idea that the people at the top are oppressive patriarchs and that they've garnered all their status, let's say, authority uh, and so-called power as a consequence of theft and pillage is completely reprehensible idea. It's not been true historically. I was just reading last night, for example, about the, the uh, tradition of elders in, in the Jewish Bible and then in el study of elder societies across the world, uh, anthropological endeavors showing that it was men who had status and stature and authority, but who were also kind and generous and beneficial to the community that were most likely to be promoted to the position of world, of, of, of uh, let's say, tribal and local leader. And, in a functional society like Australia and like most of the Western world, most of the men who are in so-called positions of power are highly competent and generally uh, as good a people as you could hope to find. Now, there are exceptions to that rule and power corrupts everything to some degree, but that doesn't mean it's the fundamental motivating force of all mankind. It's certainly no lens through which to look at history. Now, this is all a form of, of idiotic, ideological, what would you call delusion, driven by people who are too dopey to know that Karl Marx was a mass murderer and, and a, what would you say, a charlatan. So, and we are like neck deep in this foolishness everywhere in the West. Well, yes, um, the cultural Marxism, it's something that you have spoken about and it's something many uh, people who are consider themselves conservatives or centre-right warn about. But then there's an entire line of thinking that says this is a conspiracy theory. It's a right-wing conspiracy Don't confuse theory. That with there thinking. is no Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a conspiracy <laughs> well, what, theory. What's your response every, every, to that? Every university professor... Well, it's completely preposterous, a conspiracy theory. The, every bloody academic in the entire Western world is a leftist. 
I, I used to joke that I was the mm. only conservative psychologist in the world, and that's not even the case because I'm not that conservative. And so the, the idea that this is conspiracy theory is outright bloody nonsense, and the notion that these ideas aren't fundamentally Marxist in their derivation is only an idea that people have no idea what the ideas mean would claim. Like mm. people like Jacques Derrida and Michel Foucault, who are the, I would suppose, intellectual, I would suppose the intellectual leaders of the postmodern radical types knew perfectly well that their form of thinking was a derivation of Marxism. And Derrida in particular was interested in moving the so-called marginalized to the center, which is an idea very similar to the idea of moving the bourgeoisie or the proletariat to occupy the positions that the bourgeoisie held. It was just a Marxist sleight of hand. Mm -hmm. And Michel Foucault was just as interested in uh, remedi remediating what he regarded as marginalization as Derrida. So the notion that the postmodernists and the deconstruction or and the Marxists aren't aligned is absolutely foolish. And the idea that Marxism isn't uh, the strain of thought that the postmodernists, for example, in the universities turn to is preposterous. It's not a conspiracy theory. And anybody who thinks it is just has no idea what the ideas mean. Now, you've said that it's weak men we should fear, not the strong men. Uh, what sort of women should we fear? Oh, well, antisocial and narcissistic women tend to use reputation destruction as their primary mode of interacting with the world, let's say, and that tends to scale extremely well on social media. And so, you know, I've talked to female journalists who are antisocial narcissist types, and it's like, it's like dealing with a room full of snakes. Every single word they utter is a trap that's, a, a, that's, a, that's an attempt to pillory and destroy. And instead of having a civil dialogue and attempting to answer or ask genuine questions, the entire interview is nothing but a series of, of reputational traps. And in, in an age characterized by social media where narcissists can easily prevail, that's absolutely deadly. And the notion that there's no such thing as female antisocial behavior is absurd. There's a huge psychiatric literature on it. We know how it operates, and it does essentially, it does essentially center on the reputation destruction strategy that's characteristic of, well, everyone knows this, that's the culture of mean girls to you know, cite a famous movie. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, mean little nasty girls they ostracize and demean, and that scales incredibly well on social media. So that's a huge problem, and we have no idea what to do with it. It's not only women that engage in it. As I said, it's female type antisocial behavior, but men can engage in reputation savaging too. And some of the worst of those mm. are the men that ally themselves, so to so so to speak, with with feminists, so that they have a sneaky way into popularity with girls. There's no shortage of that kind of well, appalling, I, psychopathic behaviour either. Well, yes, some of the bitchiest behaviour I've seen online is from men, uh, and most of them identify as male feminists, but they can be quite misogynistic uh, when dealing with the conservative women. Now, a question I'm sure you are asked all the time, I know I'm certainly well, asked this. Well, women... And it's... <laughs> women are like minorities. Sorry, God. You know, they... they Women are like minorities. They're only acceptable when they have the proper view and they fail. <laughs> That's it, exactly. And then they, they cop it even worse. Um, now, I'm always asked, how do we get here? How do we get to such a crazy spot where saying men can't have babies is, is deemed divisive and transphobic or believing only women should compete in women's sport is, is hateful and not supporting a, a neo-Marxist group like BLM is somehow controversial. How do we get to this point, Jordan? Oh, we can pretty much blame the universities. So, I mean, when you, and I would say more particularly the faculties of education who are corrupt beyond comprehension and have done a dismal and wretched job for 70 years. And so these ideas are promoted in universities in almost all the social sciences, I would say, and certainly in the humanities and now increasingly in the sciences. And they, I, the fact that the ideas are attractive isn't that surprising because similar ideas were attractive all across the world for the bulk of the 20th century. And you no know, people all across 
the Soviet, ex-Soviet bloc suffered dreadfully as a consequence of that, but we haven't suffered because of these ideas for a long time, and people are very badly educated historically. They have no idea really what happened in the Soviet Union, for example, or during the Cold War. And so we're, you know, the, the ideas are attractive to people in some sense because they say, well, if you're suffering, first of all, that's terrible, and of course it is, but second of all, it's someone's fault and it's a consequence of an unfair social system. And the truth of the matter is social systems are always somewhat unfair and they are always somewhat corrupt, but the truth of the matter is that the systems that we've put together in the free West the free market systems and the systems based on respect for the dignity of the individual and uh, also respect for the power and necessity of the free market are the best social systems that anybody's ever created anywhere. And they're the only systems that have ever ameliorated um, absolute poverty in any real sense. So they still produce inequality, which has its downside and does produce some of the suffering that we described. But in terms of lifting people out of poverty, which means giving them enough to eat and ensuring that they have a place to, to live, let's say, um, there's nothing that compares to free market rule of law systems predicated on the dignity of the individual. But our education systems are so appalling so that, that people just don't know this. And so young people with their sort of messianic drive are easily enticed into identifying with uh, a foolish, what would you say, an unthinking unidimensional compassion for the so-called op oppressed and, and have no, no idea that the systems that we've instituted are actually the best way out, out of that oppression. Absolutely. Dr. Jordan Peterson, I could speak to you for the whole hour. We cannot wait until you come back to Australia later in the year. Tickets are for sale now. I've already purchased my tickets. Uh, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Yeah, good. Well, it'd be good to see you in Australia and I'm looking forward to coming. So thank you very much. I always enjoy your show, by the way.